This is the lecture on social psychology, or how we interact with others. Social psychology is a very large discipline within the field of psychology because although it is important to be in touch with ourselves, a great part of what we do and how we behave depends upon our interactions with other people. So social psychologists focus primarily on interpersonal associations with others and how we form impressions of other people. If you haven't already done so, go ahead and open up the PowerPoint for social psychology. The very first slide that you're going to see has different images of people. And one of the things I want to talk about first is a phenomenon in psychology, or social psychology in particular, and that is forming impressions of other people. If you take a look at the first picture, or image one, you're going to see a man who has a lot of braids in his hair, part of his head shaved, sitting in what appears to be a room surrounded by musical equipment. And what I want you to do is just think for a second, what is your first impression of this person? And then think about that a little bit more. Is this the kind of person that you would sit next to in a public place? Is this person the kind of person that you would strike up a conversation with if he was sitting off by himself someplace? Some people would say, of course, because he seems like an interesting person. Some people might say no because they think he looks kind of scary. Your personal impression can be somewhere in between. If you take a look at image two, this is a celebrity whose 15 minutes are probably up, but just based on her appearance and her clothes, you might make an immediate impression of this person. Is this person someone who is friendly? Is this person intelligent? Is this person dependable and trustworthy? These are all the things that come into impression formation. Now take a look at the third picture. This is a picture of an older gentleman sitting in what appears to be a public place. What is your first impression of this person? Does he seem knowledgeable? Does he seem friendly? Does he seem like the kind of person that you would approach in the event of an emergency? Or does he strike you the wrong way for some reason? Again, this is all part of our impression formation. The next image is of a man on a motorcycle, which looks to be a custom motorcycle. Does this person look particularly friendly? Does he look standoffish? Does he look like he would be mean? Or does he look like he would be helpful? Is this someone who could potentially be a friend of yours? The last picture is a picture of a man who has extreme body modification tattoos and piercings in particular. Again, is this the kind of person that you would strike up a conversation with? Is this the kind of person that you would cross to the other side of the street if you saw him walking toward you? Is this the kind of person you would like to get to know better? Is this the kind of person you believe would be successful in business or investments or art or any other medium? So again, we don't necessarily think about it but really, from an evolutionary perspective, it is important for us to make quick first impressions of others to decide whether or not this is someone who could potentially be of value to us, who could potentially assist us, or is potentially a threat to us. So we may not even realize that we're doing it consciously, but we are always forming impressions of other people pretty much from the moment we first see them. Sometimes those impressions turn out to be correct. However, sometimes those impressions prove not to be correct. If you take a look at the next slide, this is an overview of some of the things that I'd like to talk about with respect to social psychology. I've already mentioned forming impressions of other people. But in addition, social psychology involves making attributions for why people do the things that they do. One of the things that we as humans like to do is explain why a person engages in a particular behavior. This is called an attribution. Sometimes our attributions are correct, 
Sometimes our attributions are incorrect or are based on incorrect or incomplete information. Another aspect of social psychology that I would like for you to know is the factors that are involved in persuading other people. When we are persuading someone to follow our idea or our way of thinking, there are certain strategies that are used that are again part of interpersonal associations with others. I also want to talk about conformity and obedience. Conformity is bending to a group and obedience is essentially bending to authority. So under what conditions do people tend to walk to the beat of their own drum and in what situations do they tend to conform to the rest of the group or obey authority figures. Then I want to briefly mention behavior in groups because sometimes the way that we behave as individuals changes when we are in a group situation. And the last thing I want to mention is a phenomenon known as self-monitoring. This is how we present ourselves in public. Some people remain very true to themselves no matter what the situation, and some people are readily able to adjust how they project themselves to others for a given particular social situation. So let's take a look next at how we form impressions of others. I've mentioned a little bit about the idea that we all form impressions. It is involuntary and automatic as humans, but psychologists have studied some of the factors that go into forming impressions of others. In other words, what cognitive factors play a role in the impressions that we form of other people? Two major influences are stereotypes and prejudice. Stereotypes are general beliefs held about a group. Just a general belief held about a group. For instance, I might have a stereotype that accountants and librarians are boring people. That is just a general belief about them. Don't be offended if you are an accountant or a librarian. It's just a belief. Of course, it may not be true, but a stereotype does play into the impression that we form of others. So a general belief. Prejudice is a little bit different. A prejudice is a negative attitude held toward a group. So for instance, if I have been personally offended by a member of a certain group, I may then assume that all members of that group are rude and offensive. So not only might I have a stereotype about them, I have a negative attitude toward that entire group as well. Stereotypes in general can be positive or negative. It can go either way. I believe that all doctors are intelligent, for example. That is a positive stereotype. Whether or not it's true is a separate issue. Prejudice, by and large, are negative. There's really no such thing as a positive prejudice toward a particular group. So I want you to be able to differentiate between those two. Stereotypes are just widely held beliefs. They may be good, they may be bad. Prejudice in particular is a negative attitude toward a group that may be the result of a stereotype. Now these factors may actually lead to discrimination. Discrimination is negative behavior toward a group. So negative behaviors toward a group, which is discrimination, can be the result of stereotypes and prejudice. I'd like for you to take a look briefly at the next slide that shows a summary of the relationship between prejudice and discrimination. If you look at this table, you'll see that we have four possible conditions. We have a situation in which prejudice is either absent or present, and then the situation in which discrimination is either absent or present. So we have four possible combinations for social behavior. In the first box, you see where prejudice is absent and discrimination is absent. So really nothing's going on here. 
If you move across the top, you see a situation where prejudice is present, but discrimination is absent. So if you read the example, a restaurant owner who is bigoted against gays treats them fairly because he needs their business. In other words, the restaurant owner has a prejudice, a negative attitude toward a particular group, but he does not demonstrate any negative behaviors toward that group. So that's a situation of prejudice without discrimination. If you take a look in the bottom left corner, you'll see a situation in which prejudice is absent, but discrimination is present. You might think that this is a bit of an unusual situation. Why would you show a negative behavior toward a group when you personally have no negative attitude toward them? However, in social situations, sometimes that's exactly what happens. If you read the example, an executive with favorable attitudes towards blacks doesn't hire them because he would get in trouble with his boss. So as you can see, the executive him or herself, sorry, himself, doesn't have any personal prejudice. There is no personal negative attitude. However, due to the social situation in which he's in, that is a subordinate to a superior, he must still engage in discriminatory behaviors. So again, that is where the social psychology aspect comes in. Your personally held attitudes may or may not be revealed in the behaviors that you show, and this is a perfect example. Then in the last quadrant, in the bottom right, you see an example where both prejudice and discrimination are present, which is fairly common. For instance, a professor who is hostile toward women grades his female students unfairly. So here we have both, both the negative attitude toward women and the negative discriminatory behavior that is grading them unfairly. If you back up for a second to the previous slide, there is a very influential person that is pictured on that slide. This is a woman by the name of Jane Elliott. She was a third grade classroom teacher. And you might think, why are we talking about a third grade teacher when we're talking about prejudice and stereotypes and discrimination? Well, the reason why is because she did a very influential experiment in her third grade class that is definitely worth mentioning. This was back in the late 60s where there was a lot of civil unrest, there was a lot of prejudice and a lot of discrimination. Miss Elliott's class was in the Midwest where most of the children were white and primarily middle class. So although there was some prejudice and discrimination going on, most of it was not due to race. She felt that her students really couldn't understand the civil unrest that was going on in the rest of the country because those racial and ethnic differences just were not there in the town in which she lived. So she decided to do an experiment on her third graders. What she did was divide the third graders by eye color. Specifically, she put the blue-eyed children in one group and the brown-eyed children in another group. And she told the class on the first day of the experiment that she just found out some important information, that blue-eyed children were inferior. Blue-eyed children were not as smart. They were not as good in sports. They were not as artistic. They were not as good as on activities on the playground and so on. So she built up this sense of inferiority among the blue-eyed children. She made them wear bands for the day so they could be readily identified by everyone, particularly the brown-eyed children. So over the course of the day, the brown-eyed children got preferential treatment. They got more help on their classwork. They were um, recognized more and given self-esteem boost when they did something really good in art class or on the playground. So in other words, they were given preferential treatment. And then during the day, the blue-eyed children had the opposite treatment. They were told that they were a little bit slower, 
that they were a little bit worse, that they probably won't get picked for the team today because who really wants a blue-eyed person on their team? So by the end of the day, this foundation had been laid so successfully that one of the blue-eyed children came crying to Miss Elliot. And Miss Elliot said, why are you crying? And the boy said, because so-and-so called me a mean name. And she said, what did he call you? And he said, he called me blue eyes. So within the course of one day, the word blue eyes, the term blue eyes became a derogatory term that was associated with all sorts of negative characteristics. Pretty amazing. The next day when the children came to school, Miss Elliot said, I'm sorry, I had the results of the study backwards. It's the brown-eyed children who are the inferior ones, who aren't as intelligent or athletic or artistic, etc. So on the second day, the brown-eyed children got to experience the same kind of prejudice and discrimination that the blue-eyed children had the day before. So it was a really interesting experiment, but it also showed how quickly those attitudes can form and then how quickly those negative attitudes can lead to negative behaviors toward a perceived inferior group. So Miss Elliot showed that prejudice can be taught at a very early age and can also lead to discrimination very early on over a very arbitrary characteristic. If you'd like to find out more about it, there's a website on the bottom of that slide in which some of the students came back to talk about their experiences with Miss Elliot's class now that they're adults. They look back at how profoundly it affected them and how it made them think about the attitudes that they have toward others. Okay, skipping past the prejudice and discrimination table that we just went over, I'd like for you next to look at the slide about attributions. This is how we explain people's behavior or status. When we make an attribution, we are trying to better understand why someone does what he or she does. When we make an internal attribution, we are saying that behavior is caused by an internal trait. So for instance, if I do well on an exam, an internal attribution would be, I did well on the exam because I'm smart, because I studied hard. In other words, an internal attribution is something within, something you have responsibility for that would explain the behavior, in this case, doing well on a test. An external attribution is when we attribute behavior to external causes. So for instance, if I did well on a test, I could say, I did well on the test because the test was easy. That would be an external attribution. That has nothing to do, presumably, with how much I studied or with how smart I am, but simply the test itself was easy. This was something out of my hands, but it still explained the results. It still explained the behavior. So again, an internal attribution is when we explain a behavior by internal factors or personal factors. An external attribution is when we explain a behavior by external or situational factors. Now what gets interesting is that we as humans have biases in the attributions that we make. And I want to give you a couple of examples of those biases in attribution. The first one is called the fundamental attribution error. This is when we erroneously attribute someone's behavior to internal rather than external factors. Let me say that again. The fundamental attribution error is when we attribute someone's behavior erroneously to internal rather than external factors. Let me give you an example, a very clear and easy example. Let's say it's dinner time and you're really, really hungry 
and you're going through the drive through of your favorite fast food restaurant. The woman in the drive through gives you the wrong food and the wrong change. What is the first thing that you would say about this person? I know what it probably is. You would probably say that this person is not the smartest person in the world. In other words, you are making an internal attribution about her behavior. She messed up your food and messed up your change, or he, messed up your food and messed up your change because he or she is not smart. The reality might be that this person may have just received very bad news or was just handed the food and the change and told to give it to you, the customer, and told not even to worry about checking it or counting it. In other words, there may be a lot of external factors going on that would really explain the mistakes that were made. But our first instinct is to blame internal factors instead of external factors. So this usually happens when somebody messes up or somebody does something wrong. We automatically tend to go to an internal explanation rather than an external explanation. It would be rare for someone in the drive through sitting there hungry with the wrong food and the wrong change to say, gee, you gave me the wrong food and the wrong change. Did something happen today? Are you having a bad day today? Is there a problem going on that's distracting you? That's probably not what we're going to say, although that might actually be the appropriate thing to say because it's very likely that that's exactly what is happening, an external factor causing the behavior. The next bias that I want you to know is called defensive attribution. Defensive attribution is when we make a determination that people are responsible for the situation that they're in. In other words, again, we attribute the situation that people are in to internal rather than external factors. If you take a look at the two images on this slide, you see two images of people who are most likely hungry. The first one is of children in a third world country who are hungry and in need of food. The second one is of a group of homeless people huddled in the street somewhere. Now if you look at both of those pictures, for which picture would you be more willing to say that that situation is that person's or those people's fault? Of course, it is more likely that you will blame the homeless people for their situation, but certainly not the children. When we make a defensive attribution, we are simply saying people get what they deserve. I would say, if I was making a defensive attribution, that those people are homeless and huddled on a corner because they were lazy, because they couldn't keep a job, because they felt the world owed them something so they didn't want to have to work hard. These are all probably erroneous assumptions, but it is something that we do instinctively and automatically. In other words, we attribute people's bad situations to internal rather than external factors. People get what they deserve. Defensive attribution supports what's called the just world hypothesis. Just meaning fair. Defensive attributions support the just world hypothesis. What that means is that we want to believe that people get what they deserve and that the world is fair, the world is just, because otherwise there's no predicting what could happen to any of us. We don't want to have to deal with that fear or that anxiety. You don't want to think that you are just one layoff away from being like those people in the homeless picture. We want to believe the world is fair and just, if you work hard, you will have a nice home and nice things. If you don't believe that, if you don't believe that the world is fair, then all of us really are just one step away from being in a dire situation. So defensive attribution at some level makes us feel better about the world we live in. If we believe it's fair and people get what they deserve, 
then it only makes sense that people who are homeless are there because they deserve to be. The last bias and attribution that I want you to know is called the self-serving bias. This is when we tend to attribute our successes to internal factors and our failures to external factors. Again, the self-serving bias is when we tend to attribute our successes to internal factors and our failures to external factors. In other words, we like to present ourselves in the best possible light. So if something good happens, for instance, you get an A on your psychology test, you are much more likely to say, I got an A because I worked hard for that A. Much more likely than, I got an A because the test was really easy. So in other words, you see in your successes, it's easy to use an internal attribution as to why you did well. On the other hand, when you have failures, you're much more likely to use an external factor as the explanation. So if you didn't do so well on your psychology exam, it is much easier to say the test was too hard, the test didn't cover what we talked about in class, the test was too long, the professor graded unfairly, than to say I didn't study very hard for the test. I didn't know the material coming into the test. So again, this is just a natural automatic thing that people do. When we have a failure, we are much more likely to blame external factors than internal factors simply because it's easier. It takes the blame off of us. That's just human nature. So these are all biases and attribution, and attribution is the explanations that we give for behavior. If you take a look at the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about factors in persuasion. Persuasion as a social phenomenon is simply changing someone's attitude. Changing someone's attitude. And there are several factors that go into persuasion. If I'm trying to change your attitude about something, or if I'm trying to get you to adopt a particular attitude towards something, I have four possible factors at my disposal. The source of information, in other words, who the information is coming from. The message itself, in other words, what is being told to you. The channel factor, how that information is being conveyed to you. And then lastly, the receiver, you. What characteristics do you have that would make you more or less likely to be persuaded. If you take a look at the next slide, you're going to see a summary of the four factors. So the four factors can be summarized as who, what, how, essentially, or by what means, and to whom. So who, what, how, and to whom. When we talk about the who, that's the source factor. So think about different commercials that you see when you're being persuaded to buy a certain product or use a certain service. The factors that you see under source are all ways in which advertisers are going to get you to buy their product or use their service. Is the person telling you the information credible? You know, a mom talking about household cleaning products or chunk how good and healthy chunky soup is, is probably a little bit more credible than, let's say, a music artist talking about how much he or she loves to use pledge to clean his or her wood. A mom-like figure is more credible for household chores and for cooking. Sometimes the source factor is best based on expertise. Is this person who is telling you the information an expert in his or her chosen field? Is the person trustworthy, someone that you can depend on? Is the person likable? Is the person attractive? Attractiveness does play a role in how easily we are persuaded. And the last source factor is similarity. Is the person just like you? So often commercials use that angle. 
look at this person using this brand of toothpaste or drinking this diet cola he or she is just like you they're enjoying it they're using it they're happy with it so you should be too those are all examples of source factors who is sending the message and all of those potential factors credibility expertise trustworthiness likability attractiveness and similarity can play a role in how well you are persuaded the second column has the message factor the what what is actually being communicated sometimes in a message we use fear sometimes we use logic fear is often used for products that an advertiser wants you to believe that you can't live without. For instance, if you don't have this particular brand of deodorant, I'm sorry, you're just going to stink. If you don't have this particular kind of insurance, well, you're just living on borrowed time. So fear is a very popular way to persuade people to use particular products and services. Logic can also be used too. If you don't have time to cook dinner, well, it would just be logical for you to buy these frozen entrees. It just makes sense. So that's the actual message, the content of what's being told to you. We can see arguments, people going back and forth and coming to the conclusion that the product or service is the best one for you, if the argument itself is strong or weak. And then one of the classic, classic ways in which a message can be communicated is by simple straight repetition if you say something over and over again sometimes just that repetition can help persuade people to use a product or service or to think how they want you to think the next column has channel factors so this is how the information is conveyed to you and in today's technology age that's becoming very important as we have a very technology savvy generation coming up. They're not likely to see an ad in a newspaper or maybe even a magazine. They're much more likely to see it associated with a web page or a particular account that they have online. So channel factors, how the message is conveyed becomes really important. So obviously we have in person, someone just tells you the information television radio are also classic standby channel factors audio tape that probably a little bit dated but via computer is becoming more and more popular or through any means of technology this is how the message gets to people the how factor and then lastly is the to whom factor in other words you the receiver what do you know about this product or service? In other words, what sort of knowledge do you bring to the table? What are your personality traits? If you are more prone to anxiety, then a message that appears to fear might actually persuade you because you are a worried, anxious person by nature. You don't want to be without a particular product or service that you think you might actually need. Also, the strength of your pre-existing attitudes, that can also vary. Someone can try to sell me a particular product all day long, but if I've had bad luck with it, you're not going to be able to persuade me to get it. My pre-existing attitude and my initial attitude is one that is very poor. So all of these things can play a role in the success with which someone is persuaded. If you take a look at the next slide, I have some information about conformity and obedience, two other forms of social behavior. Conformity is when we bend or yield to a group. And some people would say, I would never go along with a group. I march to the beat of my own drum, I'm my own individual. And for some people, that is true. However, research has shown that there are some factors that play a role in conformity, in the likelihood that we will conform in a given situation. A lot of the initial studies were done by a researcher named Solomon Ash, and these studies were done in the 60s. And he had a very simple experimental setup. If you take a look at the image on this slide, 
you will see one line over to the left. And then over on the right side, you are going to see three lines labeled A, B, and C. I want you to take a look just for a moment and say which of those lines, A, B, or C, matches the line on the left-hand side. Now it's not going to take you very long to realize that the match is C. That is the right answer. So Ash used this setup to determine whether or not people would conform to an incorrect answer. Now in Ash's study, what he had was a group of people sitting in a room. Let's say there were seven or eight people. One person in this group was the actual research participant who did not know what was actually happening in this study. So in the room, the test line was shown and then the comparison lines, lines A, B, and C, and people went around the room and said which of those lines matched the first line. So person number one said, oh, definitely line B. Person number two said, oh, definitely line B. Person number three said, oh, definitely line B, all the way around the table until we got to about person number six, who was the actual research participant. So he or she would look around the room and see what everybody else had said. What do you think this person responded with? That's the interesting question. Would the person go along with the crowd and choose B? Or would the person go along with what he or she knew was right and choose C? Now you might think, Psh, I would say C in a second. It's obviously C. But in Ash's studies, about 37% of the time, the participant went along with the incorrect answer. That's a pretty sizable percentage when in this example it is so obviously wrong. In other words, in 37% of the trials, people were likely to conform, even if the conformity was to the wrong answer. Now, when Ash did more studies in conformity, he did find some factors that impacted whether or not somebody conformed. He found that people's level of conformity dropped substantially as the group size decreased. In other words, if you're sitting in a room of 20 people and everybody says the wrong answer, you are much likely to go along with that wrong answer. If, however, you're in a room with two other people and the two people give the wrong answer, you are much less likely to conform. So in other words, the larger the group, the more likely conformity will happen. The other factor in conformity is group unanimity. That means, is the wrong decision unanimous? In Ash's original studies, everybody said the wrong answer. Everybody did. The wrong answer was unanimous. And in that situation, people were much more likely to conform. But if there was just one dissenter, one person in the group who did not go along with the rest of the group, then conformity went way down. So in other words, when a group is unanimous, conformity is more likely. When there is at least one dissenter, conformity is much less likely. Another aspect of social psychology that I want you to know is obedience. Obedience is conforming to an authority figure. Most of the early research done on obedience was done in the 60s and it was a direct result of what the military was seeing people do in wartime. In times of war when people were in Korea and other war zones they were doing atrocious acts and when asked, why did you do this? In other words, why did you burn down this village that had innocent women and children? The soldier's response was simply, I was told to do so by my superior, so I did it. That started to send up some red flags about where our personal responsibility for our behavior ends 
and where simply conforming to authority. In other words, showing obedience begins. Where does personal responsibility end and where does obedience as being okay begins? So after that, there was a flurry of studies on obedience to show just how strong conforming to authority can be. The most famous study on obedience was done by a researcher named Stanley Milgram, and these studies started in the early 60s. You may have heard of this experiment before because it is very famous. In this study, Milgram had subjects, research participants, come in. Now, this is the early 60s, so the research participants were mostly white, young to middle-aged men. So, but you'll see what happens later on when we use different participants. So the participant was brought in to a laboratory-like setting and told by an authority figure, a, you know, a very impressive looking man in a lab coat with the glasses holding the clipboard, you know, someone we would assume is an authority figure, that he would be teaching, I put teaching in quotes, teaching someone in another room a list of words. So the research participant was the teacher and presumably in another room was the student. And it was the student's job to learn lists of words. When the student made a mistake, the teacher had to administer a shock. The interesting thing about the shocks was that as the students made more and more errors, the teacher had to give progressively stronger and stronger shocks. So in other words, the teacher was seated in front of a board where there was a range of switches that went all the way from, let's say, 10 volts, which is going to give you a little jolt, to 450 volts, triple X marked dangerous. So every time the student made a mistake, the teacher had to give increasingly higher doses of the shock. So over the course of the experiment, uh, the student would make mistakes and the teacher would give increasingly stronger shocks. What was interesting in the study is that in a lot of cases, as the shocks got stronger, the teacher could hear the student complaining Please stop, this hurts. Please stop, I have a heart condition. Please stop, I don't feel well. Sometimes the student would actually start banging on the wall that separated the teacher from the student, saying, please, please, please stop, let me out of here. You can't keep me here. You can't keep doing this to me. When the teacher became uncomfortable with the situation, hearing this from the other side of the wall, he would look up, at the experimenter and say something like, I don't want to continue with this. This person is in pain. This person is suffering. And the experimenter holding the clipboard in the white lab coat looking like the authority figure would simply say, you must continue with the experiment. Or the experiment requires that you continue. That was the only answer provided. So the teachers became very uncomfortable believing that they were inflicting all of this pain and harm to the students on the other side of the wall. To the point that they would stop and ask the experimenter, can I stop? I don't want to do this anymore. And when the experimenter would say, you must continue with this experiment, the teacher would say, fine, I will continue as long as I'm not held responsible for it. So do you see what happens? I will continue doing this because you are telling me to do it and I do not want to be held responsible for any of the consequences. So literally several of the teachers who were actually the research participants believed that they were administering strong severe shocks to these students. And you might think well that might be true but surely nobody would go up to 450 volts. I mean, it's marked triple X dangerous. We all know how painful that could potentially be. Interestingly, 
in Milgram studies, 65% of the teachers went all the way to 450 volts. 65%. To the point that some of the students who would say, oh, stop, I'm having a heart attack. You're killing me. You're killing me. I have a heart condition. Please stop. And in at least one case, the student could be clearly heard slumping over at the desk. The teacher still continued. Now, there are several interesting things about this study. First of all, I'm not sure it could be conducted today due to ethical considerations. Secondly, of course, the students were not actually receiving the shocks. They were confederates. They were people that were part of the experiment who knew what was actually going on. So no harm was actually inflicted. But the teacher believed that he was actually administering shocks to those students. And that's really all that matters. The teacher believed that he was administering those shocks to the student. And the teacher said, I'll continue this as long as I'm not held responsible. And once they were told that they would not be held responsible, they shock them all the way to the end. So it's actually a pretty scary commentary on just how much we would conform to an authority figure. In other words, how obedient we can be. So you might say, well, that's all well and interesting, but certainly that must have been a one-time thing. It wasn't. Milgram replicated this study several times, all with about the same percentage of people going to the 450 volt shock. So you might say, well, surely women wouldn't be that mean. Women wouldn't be that obedient if they knew that someone was suffering or believed that someone was suffering. Wrong. Women were just as likely. About 65% of women in the experiment also went all the way. The key here is whether or not the teacher believed that he or she would not be held responsible for whatever happened to the student. So again, maybe things have changed with you know, later generations, but it's interesting to note that people will obey as long as they believe that they will not be held personally responsible for any negative consequences of the situation. If you go to the next slide, there is another famous obedience study that I think is worth mentioning. This is known as the Stanford Prison Study. This research was conducted by a psychologist named Phil Zimbardo back in the early 70s. And again, this is another one of those classic psychology experiments that was so unethical it probably could not be run today. But in this study, Zimbardo put an ad in the paper for young males who were interested to be paid to be part of a psychological experiment on prison conditions. The reason why he undertook this research is because there was growing unrest and growing hostility and poor conditions in marine prisons. And the Navy, who administers these prisons, wanted to know why that was, why conditions were deteriorating in the prisons and why the guard and inmate relationship was so hostile. So from a grant, Zimbardo got paid to study this. So he put an ad in the paper and several men responded and they were randomly assigned to be either guards or prisoners in a mock prison setting. So Zimbardo did not do any kind of personality testing and pick out people who were more characteristic of a guard and people who were more characteristic of a prisoner. The assignment was totally random. The mock prison was set up in the basement of the psychology department at Stanford University. This is why it's called the Stanford Prison Study. And in this study, Zimbardo simply told the men who were playing the guards that they could do whatever they wanted to subdue the prisoners as long as they didn't inflict bodily harm. For instance, they couldn't use clubs or anything like that. But they could use any other means at their disposal. Make them do repeated exercises like sit-ups and push-ups. Make them scrub toilets with a toothbrush. Make them just stand for hours and hours. Anything that they could think up to do, they did, short of actual 
physical abuse. So, of course, the prisoners ended up revolting to this kind of treatment. Now, remember, these were all randomly assigned people. These people had no particular guard personality characteristics or prisoner characteristics, but they fell into their roles very, very readily. The guards were essentially abusive, again, without using physical force. The prisoners began to break down physically and become ill and emotionally. The study was supposed to last for two weeks, but about halfway through the study, a social worker came in to interview some of the guards or prisoners and saw that the conditions were becoming so atrocious that the experiment was shut down after six days because she blew the whistle. So if you take a look at some of the images on this first slide, the one at the top is an image of somebody being, quote, arrested. The prisoners were actually arrested outside of their homes in California and went through all of the procedures associated with an arrest. We see a picture of a man behind bars. We see next, if you go down, a picture of people being lined up on a wall and someone's doing push-ups. They were identified, the prisoners were identified only by number. They didn't shave their heads, but they often wore stocking caps to make them all look somewhat uniform. So as you can see, they were stripped of their unique identity. And in the bottom picture, you see two guards with a prisoner. The guards took to wearing the reflective silver sunglasses because when you wear reflective sunglasses, people can't see your eyes. So they felt that that gave them more of a sense of authority and the prisoners couldn't see what was really behind those glasses. If you take a look at the next slide, you can see some of the conditions that the prisoners had to endure. They had solitary confinement. They had to stand against the wall. Again, clean toilets with a toothbrush. They had to get deloused. That's that picture at the very bottom with a paper bag over one of the inmates' heads. And then there's a picture off to the right of one of the prisoners simply breaking down. If you read the quote here, it says one prisoner developed a rash all over his body because they had a mock parole hearing and he had been turned down. So as you can see, conformity to obedience happened so quickly that within a matter of days, these people had totally become the role that they were playing. The guards were obedient to the warden. The warden was played by Dr. Zimbardo, who told them, you must keep the prisoners in line. And then the prisoners actually had emotional and physically negative reactions to having to be obedient to these guards who were doing terrible things to them. So again, it was a very interesting study in just how powerful obedience can be in that it shows us why that relationship is not necessarily a good or healthy one and how it can easily be abused. So that's why there should be a lot of things in place to make sure that that relationship does not become an abusive one. If you take a look at the next slide, the last category of topics that I want to mention is with respect to group behavior. People sometimes act differently in groups than they would act as a single individual. One of the saddest examples of group behavior in which there are negative consequences is called the bystander effect. The bystander effect occurs when someone is in need in a large group of people and everyone in the group assumes that someone else is going to help and as a result nobody helps. So in the bystander effect we assume that someone else in the group is going to help a person in need and as a result nobody helps. So what happens psychologically is what is called diffusion of responsibility where nobody feels individually responsible to help because of that belief that someone else will. This happens all too often in large public events where people end up having heart attacks or something else serious happens because everybody assumes that someone else is going to get help or call 911 and as a result no one does. So just knowing that 
if you take nothing else away, always remember that if someone is in need and you're in a large group, please be the one who goes to find help because it is likely that diffusion of responsibility will happen and no one will help as a result. One of the most tragic examples of the bystander effect happened to a young woman who back in the late 60s, I'm sorry, mid 60s, was coming home from work at a bar and her name was Kitty Genovese. And she was coming home from work at about two in the morning in New York, particularly in Queens, and she was attacked by a man. This man attacked her in the stairwell of her own apartment and stabbed her repeatedly. She screamed for help. There were no fewer than 38 people who saw her being attacked or heard her scream. No one called the police. The attacker was scared off and left. So Kitty was laying, bleeding in front of her apartment building. The attacker came back a short time later and ended up killing her by stabbing her even more. She was stabbed a total of 17 times. And like I said, no fewer than 38 people were witnesses to the event, but nobody called the police because everyone assumed that somebody else was calling the police. So by the time someone did think to call the police, it was much too late. Kitty was already gone. Interestingly, the man who attacked Kitty was found guilty of her murder and several other attacks. So he is spending life in prison. But interestingly, while in prison, he earned a bachelor's degree in sociology. So I want you to think about that for a second. But this is a tragic example of how the bystander effect can literally hurt someone or affect someone or actually be fatal. So do not engage in that behavior. The other type of group behavior that I want you to know is called group polarization. Group polarization is when we tend to act in a more extreme way in a group than we would as individuals. In other words, a group becomes polarized. They become more radical or more extreme and act in a way differently than the individuals of that group might act. Group polarization is the psychological phenomenon that underlies things like strikes and riots. Because once people get in a group and once people get energized, and once they become polarized or more extreme, they are more likely to engage in radical behavior. So sometimes even a group decision at a workplace can be more radical than what an individual's decision might be. So it is something to keep in mind. A group can behave much more radically than an individual would. The last thing I want to mention is the idea of self-monitoring, which is something that I had on one of the earlier slides. Self-monitoring refers to how we present ourselves in a group or social situation. There are basically two types of self-monitors, the high self-monitor and the low self-monitor. A high self-monitor is considered to be a social chameleon. This person will adjust his or her behavior, attitudes, demeanor, posture, anything about him or her, depending on the situation. So this is a person who is going to act much differently at work compared to at home, compared to going out, compared to in a place like church, compared to maybe spending time with the grandparents. This person is going to change or adjust themselves to meet what they believe is required of them in given different given social situations. A low self-monitor is the exact opposite. A low self-monitor is going to be himself or herself no matter what the situation is. He or she is going to act the same way no matter if you're at home, at work,
at church, going out, at grandparents' house. They're going to be the same wherever they go. So to a low self monitor, a high self monitor might look like kind of a two-faced person because he or she presents himself in a different way depending on the situation. To a high self monitor, a low self monitor might be considered to be rude because he or she simply cannot adapt to a given situation and behave more appropriately. So it's pretty interesting to see the difference in perception for high self monitors to low and for low self monitors to high. So if you take a test to measure this, you can find out whether or not you are really more of a social chameleon or if you really stay true to yourself no matter what the si social situation is. This ends the lecture on social psychology.